<laughs> right, we go again for take five. This is take five. What's happening, people? This is episode sixteen of the Arcade Podcast. Uh, welcome back for another episode. We had a a week hiatus of the podcast because uh, I decided to leave for a week. Uh, that was Don't call it a comeback, though. We never yeah, left. We're, we're back, back we're on back, top of this Arcade Podcast game. This is episode sixteen, Joel. And I had a guest on today, so Joel, why didn't you take over the floor and tell the people what they want to know about our guest? So we had our guest on today, Gwen Crabb. She is a fellow, well, I say a fellow student at Cardiff Met. I'm no longer there, but she's a student at Cardiff Met studying Scram. And lucky for her, she's in Scram 1, and we all know Scram 2 is the best. So that's uh, the only floor she's got going for her. She is a international rugby player for... Wales women. She had 13 caps. She's played at Worcester, now signed at Gloucester Rugby, and she is also doing bits with performance and nutrition over at her Instagram. And I also forgot to mention she is a internationally renowned DJ. And yeah, we'll link her SoundCloud down below if uh, you want to listen to her mixtape. Will she be at IB Open this year? This season, this next um, season coming this up. This year, yeah, I think Solomon plus Gwen- Solomon plus Gwen Crab. <laughs> <laughs> anyway enjoy the episode folks but have you done like djing before then that's intrigued me now because if you didn't know our buddy dan evs in the top corner used to be a pretty pretty keen dj as well <laughs> uh well basically i um uh my dad and my boyfriend bought me dj decks for my birthday uh which is in june i've, I've wanted to do it for ages but like never really got around to it so they bought they bought me decks then for my birthday so yeah. See. are you any good though well, I'd say I'm average, but considering like I haven't done it that, that much, I, I think I'm all right. I don't know. <laughs> modesty. Modesty this time yeah. in the morning. We'll have to link uh, Gwen's SoundCloud as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> listen, listen to my mixtape. Fire! <laughs> <laughs> but uh. rolling on from there then, so apart from prolific DJ and, um, you know, all around good person, what else is happening in the life of Gwen? Uh, yeah, so I've recently signed for Gloucester, uh, like I said. Um, so I've been training there pre-season for about a month now. Um, so that's going really well. Like, nice to get back in training after so long, just training yeah. by yourself. How is it with the old social distancing thing? Because we haven't gone back training yet. So it's... Yeah, it's, it's pretty strict. There's like one-way systems uh, everywhere. Like in the gym, you're in groups of three, but those you like have different stations so you never really you can't you're not allowed in the same station you have to wipe equipment before you use it again um and then like all drills and stuff we're split into two groups and then we only share one ball for that ball session if you're in that group and then the other group has a different ball so if you switch drills you have to take your ball with you that kind of stuff um and then we've recently moved on to stage two which is like uh more sort of rugby based like a lot of it was just conditioning and and like light skills basically but now we've moved on to like a little bit of pad work and that kind of stuff but again you like hit the pad and you have to wipe the pad before someone else uses it <laughs> it yeah. slows training down a bit then doesn't it yeah it does no yeah. ideal mm. so with that then you've just signed for Gloucester so mm-hmm. where did you come from where'd you go um, yeah I was playing for Worcester last year um mm. but like with uni and then uh welsh rugby and stuff i only managed to get like four games in for worcester um and then gloucester is like 40 40 minutes closer um so i just chose to move to gloucester basically uh instead all oh, right yeah travel travel is horrendous and with that so you said you're in uni and the welsh set up go on what are you doing in uni first i know you went to well, you go into the Cardiff Met, so yeah. Um, strength conditioning and rehab and massage is my the scram. Point. What yeah. scram are you in? What do you mean? What um, like class? What group? Scram one. Oh, see, I was a scram two kid. I was scram two <laughs> through and through, but yeah, how are you finding the course anyway? Because obviously, all three of us went to uni to study some sort of strength conditioning. Dan went to USW. God forbid him, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's good. Like. It fits. I find that the course fits really well with like my life as it is because a lot of the stuff that I've learned from being in an elite environment with like the Welsh setter is just transferred really nicely across to, like my rehab and S and C side of things. So like it put me at a huge advantage in terms of like my prax and that kind of stuff. So I knew a lot of it um, and like how it should be coached because I'd had that delivered to me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It and does I, I know it's a better position. 
Yeah, because I, I noticed when I was coming into the um, the scram and especially rehab, I've spent about four years on the sideline just getting rehabbed. Yeah. So yeah. it was like, right, what did I have to do? How do I do it? Telling other people. Yeah. So, so yeah, it does have like, a it does have a massive carryover, yeah, doesn't it? Like I um, ruptured my ACL like uh, two years before I went to uni. So like that whole process of being rehabbed and uh, and that in a, like in an elite environment was just like basically the entire rehab course given to me on like on pieces of paper which was ideal but yeah, not you, ideal that I can't. Away, but yeah yeah i don't know you take the rough with the smooth had, had the lifetime rehab experience but ruptured yeah. acl we'll we'll yeah. come back to that i think from the start but the big thing is the welsh setup so tell us what you've been doing in the welsh rugby setup and then jump into why you wanted to come on the podcast because we've had a little chat off here about some of the things that are going on in the female rugby scene so give us a background on what you've been doing with the welsh rugby how long you've been there and then you can delve into your topic of you know why you want to come on the podcast and speak up about it yeah, uh, so I got my first cap in November 2018 um, against Hong Kong. That was after having like a year and a bit out with my ACL. Um, and then since then, I've had 13 full international caps. Um, so like the last game we played was against England and the Nations before our last game got cancelled against Scotland. But we that's scheduled to be replayed um, at the end of October. So that's something to look forward to. Um, yeah, so just be, I play second row. Um, so just that's my position really um and then in terms of what's been going on recently in the media and stuff um uh the the irish rugby union launched their um new women's jersey um through canterbury uh but actually used um female models rather than the players but launched the men's kit with the men's players so um uh, one of the girls that I know launched, uh, basically, she has um, a company called the Perception Agency, which is uh, about uh, promoting female sport. And she put up a, a tweet, basically, um, calling them out to say, look, these are two identical posts, except one's using models and one's using the players. Um, and then from there, really, um, the whole sort of female rugby community has gotten behind this movement of um, hashtag enough, it's called. But... Um, it's basically about that w we shouldn't have to sort of justify um, why we should be because a lot of the girls are like oh it's it's only fair that um, we we're playing in the jerseys so that's why we, sh we shouldn't have to justify why we should be more than our own jerseys and from my perspective I've I've been lucky enough to actually model the Welsh jersey um, in photo shoots and I've been in the calendar for to, uh, 2020 and stuff like that so it's, it's really good that the WIU are behind us there but then to still see stuff like that going on um, is just a bit of in injustice really mm. Yeah and I think with that it, it goes back down to the, the whole the gap between men and women in sport at the minute and I know I just saw I think there was two football clubs that have gone for, I think, I want to say it's England and someone yeah, else. Brazil. I've, yeah. Yeah, I've gone for their, their equal pay between men and women. And I yeah. think that's like a step in the right direction because at the minute, um, there's just so much stereotyping with female sport. Have you received any of that yourself? or? Um, yeah, like I've had uh, comments like, oh, like you don't look like you play rugby, like that kind of stuff. And you think, what's that supposed to mean? Like, if you look at the men, they're all different shapes and sizes. No one would go up to a bloke and be like, oh, you don't look like you play rugby uh, kind mm. of thing. And just a lot of like, especially going into uni, it was like, um, oh, our third team could beat Wales women. Like, oh, come on. Like, it, you can't compare genders. That's the biggest thing that, that irritates me is that like, oh, if I was a girl, I'd be starting for Wales. Well, you're not a girl and you can't compare if you were a girl. <laughs> they're two completely different genders that mm. have different like physiology. So you can't compare it. Um, so I've experienced a lot of that, but I've been lucky enough that like a lot of people I'm friends with and stuff sort of support the whole women's rugby and women's sport. So I've been lucky in that sense. Yeah, yeah. and that, that that's the thing with it. I think it just needs to be spoken up. And Dan, I know you've done a little bit of research on the hashtag enough, didn't you? I, you I had a look into it. I had a brief look at the Twitter. Um, I'm going to get it up again right now. But yeah. 
so with the the perception agency is that the the account yeah so what what are they looking to do obviously just raise awareness how how are they going about it at the minute so they've actually joined uh, they've sort of done like a collaboration with uh, loose heads it's just a clothing brand uh, for rugby and they've done a collaboration now and they've launched a campaign to raise money i think uh, for uh, like awareness of women's rugby and women's sport um with it's like the loose heads logo and then it says like hashtag enough um and they've right. had a load of um well like well-known women's rugby players modeling that uh top for them um so that just got launched either yesterday or the day before i think so we've got the like quote is because role models are real models we are more than enough and we've had enough yeah. but it's actually seen that that um canterbury from today well from the I don't know what date it was, but sometime in August. Um, all their campaign photo shoots will ensure photographs are taken with male and female rugby players. Yeah, so that was a big like outcome that came out from like all yeah. this. It was one day basically where we all just posted pictures uh with captions about like experiences we'd had uh with discrimination or stereotyping and that kind of stuff. And then the d- the day following that then Canterbury came out with that statement to say that from now on they they like promise to use uh, women's rugby players for their launches. So that was really positive. Yeah. So like yeah, it's, it's, what we discussed that we we had a little discussion yesterday off air um, about the if you ask like children who their role models are in like sport or like any any sort of like up and coming like athlete who their role models are, they're always sort of like male. pretty well known male athletes, yeah. and you never usually see that sort of like. Oh, so and so, so and so. Um, as a as a women athlete, yeah. you know, there, there's never that comparison. Like, oh, I want to be like her in that yeah. particular other, realm. Other than maybe sports like tennis, so you've got players like Serena Williams, Serena, yeah, um, or you know Jessica Ennis in athletics. Other and but there's small margins of girls that are are in like athletics or tennis, for example. Like mm. the the really popular sports like netball, football, rugby, because they are really popular with, with girls now. Like there's so many yeah. girls play football and rugby now. Um, like they don't really know anyone. Like, well, I know that yeah. when I was young, I didn't know any any like famous female sports people. Yeah, where, obviously, where do you think that that's what comes from there? Because like obviously, female sport has 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 come from as you know, mm. it's been pretty sort of like large as and you yeah. know females are you know participation in sport is, is just as high now yeah. as males i don't pull that statistic you know from yeah. anywhere specific but like i assume that female yeah. participation in sport is higher than it's ever have been and yeah. still you're not getting the sort of you know the recognition and you know female sport isn't really as you know l- as large as male sport is at the moment why do you think that why, why do you think why do you actually think that is then I think like a lot of effort and work has been put into like grassroots level, like for girls uh, in all different sports. So you've got that, but then if you actually think about it, like the media coverage um, and sort of the publicity isn't there for female sport in general. Like it has gotten a lot, lot better. Like women, like Wales women have certain slots like over Six Nations where they, you, they post on the Instagram uh, like the Welsh rugby Instagram, that kind of stuff. Like I said, like for the girls were in the calendar, like that's a huge step in the right direction. Um, that kind of stuff. But then they've got like the grassroots level, but then those girls have nothing to aspire to because the media coverage isn't there for mm. like, like there's girls, um, my sister plays under 18 rugby and like there's girls that only know me there because I'm her sister rather than being like they're aspiring to be where I am in in like the international rugby setup so it's like they don't really put I think it's you know like in if um a young boy was to meet Alan Jones or something it'd be yeah. like a ridiculously huge deal like fat yeah. like fanboying mm. over them whereas I think like we're just sort of like other people like if I was yeah. to go to girls it's just like oh she's my mate like not like oh my god I, I like I'd love to be like her so yeah. is this just a link I think that just is missing I think a lot of it is media coverage and so yeah. putting out like also like like I said to you off air that we don't like we don't get paid 
Um, mm. And so everything about our setup and everything about us is professional, other than the fact that we get paid. So we're trying to live like professional athletes without the funding to do it, um, which is really hard for us to maintain. So then I guess it can come, sometimes come across like, I was speaking to a young girl and she was like oh how can I get how can I get to the international set I'm like you just you just have to re work really hard and get no money back <laughs> like that's yeah. what it's like at the minute whereas for the boys it's a career like yeah as soon as, as soon as you're like 12 and you're decent at rugby it's like get you into the academy bro and that's your career um yeah. whereas for us it's literally just a hobby yeah because I, I was having a chat with um some people yesterday and they were on about how um you can over prioritize the gym um, over the sport, but the sport is what's going to get you paid at the end of the day. And that's what's going to help you bring home um, and feed families. You know what I mean? And be a career path for you. But with women's rugby, you you're expected to put the whole, um, whole effort in nothing changes between the gym standpoint, nothing changes between the training. You've just got to come in and do it all for free. So um, with that, how, how do you cope yourself? Because Obviously, being a uni student as well, um, how do you cope with um, balance and everything? Because it's quite a lot to throw in when you're not getting any financial support from it. Yeah, um, like the first time I really saw this was like, because I got my first cap in freshers. So it was like, I sort of had more time. Like I was kind of like living the dream because I had like plenty of time in the day to do my recovery, to do my gym sessions, and then just like rock up a train in the night. It was all great. And then going into second year, we had five international games, five weeks on the bounce, and three of those were away. Um, mm. So we had to get flights. Uh, so that was the first time where I was like, oh my God, like this is, this is difficult. But it literally took like downloading papers, downloading stuff on my computer, and everyone else is like having a laugh on the plane, and I'm sitting there typing up a rehab plan. Like that is, the, that is how I had to do is just constant like if I wasn't in rugby focus or like doing analysis I was doing my uni work um and like in between lectures um I was either in the gym or I was like in the SU doing work um so it's pretty it's pretty non-stop but like it's you've just got to be organized but I still see it as like I'm lucky that I'm a student because if I was in full-time work I, I honestly don't know how I how I'd do it and I don't know how the other girls do it either because mm. you know working like eight ten hour day and then going to training four or five till not getting home till like 10, 11 at night and then doing it all again the next day is like, it's very, very hard. But it, that's, it, that's the reality of it. If you don't do that, you don't get paid. It doesn't really make any sense. If you want to get the most, to me anyway, if you want to get the most out of the player, you want to take as much of that stress off them as possible. So like having a, a sort of like institution, which kind of like forces the athletes into full-time work because they can't, they can't afford not to. Yeah. And then expect to get absolute like peak performance out of them, and you know the best out of them as possible. It's just a little bit counterproductive to me. Yeah. yeah. So that that's just my thoughts on it. It's like I don't know. It's the, how... it's the thing about like so obviously like as a student I get my student loan, but that's the only money I get. So yeah. I've got to pay for all the food that they want me to be able to eat to be able to perform, um, which is a lot of food. Uh, are very expensive um then i've got to pay for my petrol like we do get petrol expenses uh, but that comes in at the end of the month so at the time i'm paying for my petrol i'm paying for my rent and all the other things that come with like li like renting a house that kind of stuff but then i'm not getting any income back whereas a lot of people in uni will have part-time jobs and everyone's like i want to get a part-time job and i'm like i already i have technically a part-time to full-time job that i don't get paid for so yeah. it's really difficult to try and split that that like student loan across the months like I needed to to survive, but then not have any more money coming in. It's like just constantly draining. Yeah, because yeah. I didn't know that I actually was quite naive the fact that you you didn't get paid mm. at that level as a female. Yeah, a lot of people are, and that that's like part of the reason why I wanted to come on you is to to raise the awareness of that. Like we've had comments after Six Nations games, like, oh, imagine being this shit at your day job. Like, oh, if you were this shit at your day job, you would, um, you'd get sacked and all this. And, we're, and we're, we're reading these comments and we're like, don't like, don't comment on something if you're not educated enough on it to know yeah. that this is no day job. Yeah. It, it honestly is. So it's, and that's the kind of like trolling that like, we've all literally had enough of it. Like you can't say to people, oh, you crap at your day job when, it's not our day job that we yeah. have local girls like nurses teachers like they work in gyms on top of it yeah 
Yeah, and how do you cope? Because obviously the big thing at the minute is mental health, and we've been stuck in lockdown, and we've seen the effect that it has on some people, and we've already seen the effects in the past of these like trolling comments, you know. Um, people think it's easy to do what you do, whatever, and then they just pass a comment on Facebook, and they think, oh, yeah, look, I could have done that job better. But how do you cope? Is there any like strategies that um, like teams have put in place to help players deal with it, or is it like you're on your own sort of thing with it yeah like well a lot of it is just try not to read comments on stuff which is easier said than done but like with wheels mm. we have uh, a psychologist that we can book in book in if, we, uh, if and when we need uh, before training and for games or whatever uh but like personally i tend to like they don't really bother me these comments because i'm just like oh that, that person's naive like one they're never they're not going to affect my life they're not going to affect how i perform so what's the point in really paying attention to it? Um, but then I do, I guess I, like m- mental health wise, I, I struggle like every sort of three, four weeks or whatever, it'll all get like all the training will catch up with me. And then I'll just have like one or two days where I just like feel like crap. And I'm like, I'm tired of making, like I can't keep doing this. But then after that, like next few days, I'm like, okay, it's fine. I'm back on it now. Mm. But it, it can get difficult. Like, because what I find is that like, time's going so quickly with because you're, you're like you're either training or planning for. I was saying to the girls like the other day that like every day at the minute I'm either planning for training the next day or got training that day, which we have to travel two hours for. So it's like you're either planning for training or doing the training. So then the, your whole life just revolves around it, and then it time goes so quick, and then you just stop and like you have like a day off and you're reflecting on it, and you're like, Jesus, like this is really hard. Um, mm. so I struggle with like that, but, um, it has been a lot more difficult at the minute because of how different training is. Like we can't see, we can't stick around and like talk to each other after training. It's very much like you tra- you get in, you train, you leave. Like the social aspect isn't there at the minute. And I think that's how a lot of us cope with it. Like going for social coffees and stuff, going for food together. Um, because like we're all going through the same thing. So it's nice to like talk to other people about it, but that are going through it as well, but that's been taken away from us at the minute because of COVID. Yeah, and I know that's that's one of the reasons why I've stuck around in the rugby scene is, you know, you have those times where you're battling with injuries or whatever and, you know, you've had six, seven months out, but when you go there, you've got all the, all, all the tre- team around you, like just, you know, having that laugh, having a joke, you can go in, you can have your banter, you can have your coffees, you can chill out and you can actually just de-stress and chat to like your mates at the end of the day. And, that's one thing that I'm a little bit weary about going back to training now is how it's going to run because obviously you're in the English setup at the minute um, and then the Welsh setup will run it differently. So I don't know how things are going because I know for the Premiership, for example, they, um, we're, we're still not training yet. Grassroots can go back and do a little bit, but because of um, a whole bunch of reasons, we're, we're sat just like waiting around and I think we find out on the 17th. So it'd be interesting to find out what what the crack is with it all but is there light at the end of the tunnel for rugby like game time with you because with the phases when do you think you'll be allowed to play at um club level yeah so we've had uh we've basically had to go ahead that our first club fixtures on the 10th of october so that's only a month away now so yeah definitely light at the end of the tunnel and then like i said we've got that uh, international fixture against scotland on the 30th of october so when we get into like October now, it'll be good. Um, and then hopefully Six Nations will go uh, as planned next year. And then we've got the Women's World Cup next year in New Zealand as well. So that's a lot to look forward to. Yeah, so you've got a, a lot of rugby lined up then. So that, that yeah. schedule I'm freeing up anytime soon. <laughs> so with that then, because with the aim to be a rugby player, I can assume, um, how, how would you go about that? So... Like you said, um, a lot of people in the Welsh team are working jobs. Are there still opportunities for you to make a career out of rugby? Um, so hopefully um, we're going to be getting contracted um, some point next year. So uh, obviously it's all dependent on funding and that kind of thing. But at some point next year, hopefully we'll get um, a certain amount of contracts. I like, don't know how much that is going to be, don't know anything, but as a student that like will be graduating next year that's like ideal because that's that like I finish uni and then that's sort of my career then um obviously like with S&C like I want to do S&C 
um but i can't at the like i can't get internships and stuff because it clashes with all of my training like i can't go and intern with a team uh when they're training and playing the same days as me so i have to like put my potential like future career on, on the back burner for a minute while rugby is in the foreground but hopefully in like years to come or whatever i can do a pgc alongside rugby like or do a masters alongside rugby so that i've got then um something to fall back on if i get injured or when i retire yeah and i think it's always good to have that that backup plan and um with the work in internships in snc i can imagine you know that the long hours that we work in snc alongside the long hours that you train they just don't clash very well and i i knew growing up when i was in that academies whatever we'd be in probably like four or five times a week and even then trying to find um some work when you're in for what two three hours it, it clashes with everything and people people just don't want the hassle that comes with it so yeah i can imagine when you're in the international setup is uh, probably a bit more complicated there yeah definitely yeah so with the snc obviously we are at on a podcast that chats fitness and training, what is uh, a training week in the like in the like in the life of a professional female rugby player? Okay, so if I I'll sort of say like pre lockdown and then how it changed when I went into lockdown. So like <laughs> lockdown, absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. Eat everything um, in sight. The opposite. <laughs> like um, so throughout the Six Nations, we normally have um, training. So we play on a Sunday. Then we'd train on a Tuesday, Thursday, then go back into camp on the Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday. So that was it's literally pretty much every day. Like obviously Monday and Wednesday you have off, but like you're, you're either doing your recovery sessions or an extra gym session or whatever you need to do. And that analysis as well takes over a lot of the week because you're like say Monday you're analysing the game for the weekend, then on Wednesday you've got to analyse the weekend the opponents for the next week so it's pretty full on during six nations and then throughout lockdown it was pretty i literally was just like okay i've got nothing else to do i'm just going to train all the time so it would be like gym gym and speed session on a monday conditioning and gym session on a tuesday uh recovery day wednesday speed and gym on a thursday conditioning and gym on a friday gym and off week conditioning on a saturday rest day sunday yeah, hefty <laughs> schedule that. Yeah, I know. So yeah. I don't know that. What's that? About twelve sessions a week. Yeah, and then like recovery was looking like like twenty k bike ride or just like nothing to do. Or, like like half hour yoga session. Like especially the the first sort of like three months of lockdown, I was just absolutely going wild. Didn't really have many rest days because I wouldn't really classify like a bike ride as that much of recovery. Pretty active recovery 20k on the bike yeah that's my full lower body session done for the day <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so well I, I didn't have much else to do so i was just like once i'd finished the rest of my uni work that i'd left i was just like well this is this is as close to a full-time professional athlete i'm gonna get for now so we may as well make the most of it i thought that what wise decision making the most of it i know some people you know just fell and succumbed to the lockdown blues and just sat there but with the training side of things, I know being a PT, and I'm sure Dan um, has had it before, the whole, I don't lift weights, I'll get too bulky. Yeah. And all that connotation around females lifting weights. Mm. So with your training, mm-hmm. do you do weights? Obviously, yeah. Yeah, like, yes. like I was saying, five, five weight sessions a week uh, over lockdown, and they were like hour and a half long each. So, were they on the stay master at all with a glute band? Were they thousands of reps of glute bridges? The only reason I will ever touch a glute band is for prehab, rehab, and if I get told I really have to. <laughs> Say it louder for the people in the back. <laughs> Say it louder for Grace fit in the back. I've never actually ever been on a stair master, if I'm honest with you. I've been on it once to film a video taking the piss <laughs> out of people on a stay master with a glute band. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, for a training for a training week, for example, um, how would you structure your training? So, being a professional athlete, um, I ensure there's a big emphasis on strength development, power development, and that involves lifting some heavy weights. And 
just be have it. You you haven't got muscles and you couldn't step on the the Olympia stage from training as females think they are. So how would you structure a training week and would you advocate then females um, lifting weights and how would you go about easing them into it? Because that's one big thing that we struggle with is the whole oh I don't want to lift too weight uh, I don't lift too much weights you know I I want this toned look. Yeah. Well, firstly, I think the way to get a toned look is lifting weights because. If you don't have the muscles there, you, like how can they be toned? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, so like when we have a game on the weekend, it'll be like normally only two gym sessions, and then maybe if you get like limited game time on the weekend, then you do an extra hypertrophy session the next day. Uh, but it would be like strength on the Tuesday, and then like power on the um, Thursday. Um, like in my position, strength and power are like so important because strength for scrummaging. Um, and then power, I, I'm like a main line out jumper, so power is really, really important, as well as tackling and um, ball carrying and that kind of stuff. Um, but then, like, over lockdown, I was literally flat out hypertrophy for like five, six weeks. Ooh, like, them games. When I worked out uh, the total amount of squats I did in one session, because we had like single leg squats, back squats, front squats, um, and I, I did 105 squats in one session altogether. And I was like, Jesus, that's a lot of squats. Like, but I've actually I've done seen, that this month. <laughs> I've actually seen like huge improvements in my body composition from increasing that that amount in the gym. Like I'd say I was eating the same now as I was in the Six Nations, but because like I was so fatigued and I was only doing two gym sessions a week from actually focusing more on hypertrophy and more on strength, uh, without the sort of fatigue of rugby, my body composition, I think I've lost about two percent body fat. Um yeah. lost five kg over lockdown and put a bit back on now because we're going back into rugby like i need to have a bit more weight but it's like completely changed my body composition and i've actually felt a lot more confident because of it so like i can't advocate like strength training enough for women because i just personally feel like one you feel a lot lot better about yourself like if you girls are like oh i want a big bum like squatting hip thrusting that's how you get a big bum like yeah. <laughs> there is no two ways about it you can't sit there with a group band and expect that to do it like that's good for activation maybe do that before your squats so that's a good idea but not as a replacement for them yeah and also just day-to-day life like life's so much easier when you're strong yeah you have enough strength to do daily act- like activities like you don't have to worry about carrying the shopping bags to the car you don't have to worry about lifting things or not being able to move something like it's just it's just easier isn't it yeah exactly and I, what what I find is it's like as soon as you sort of like get that co- past that conversation of like you know I'm not gonna sit next to you thirty minutes on the fucking treadmill and chat to you about your day like once you get them in the gym and the, lifting the weights they fucking love it yeah it's enjo- it is really enjoyable like so you've just yeah. got to, like a lot you know first month or whatever it is going to be difficult because you're going through movements that you've never done before. Mm. Um, you, you're getting used to it you might not be able to squat the right depth it might be painful that kind of stuff but like as soon as you start seeing progression like there's nothing there's nothing better than putting putting weight especially when you're, you're a beginner and like within a month you've added 20 kg to your squat like at the minute i'm lucky if i can add anything but that kind of thing like yeah. i feel you there <laughs> three years for a pb and i was like oh well this is this ain't all it cracked up to be anymore i wish i could go back five years yeah and um, go on. Go on. Oh. Um, yeah, like what I found from lockdown is I, I didn't have bench press uh, for like 16 weeks, maybe a bit more. Um, and I was just doing press ups. Like I had had a floor press, but you can't really go as heavy. Like I just couldn't find like I go, could go as heavy and the range of movement wasn't there and stuff. So I was like, oh, my bench PB is going to get so shit. Like I'm going to lose so much strength. Went to my friend's house, who's got a gym then when lockdown eased a bit. And I hit a PB bench. And I was like, how? like, so it goes to show, like, you don't necessarily need to be constantly lifting ridiculously heavy and that kind of stuff. You just need to be yeah. resistant training and you'll, like, you'll get stronger. Like, I was honestly shook, like, because I didn't floor press more than 50 kg the entire time. I was doing press ups and stuff, and then I had a PB of 75 kg bench. Like, it didn't make sense, any sense. I, I was that's a and big, <laughs> that's a big bench. That <laughs> Dan is like, <laughs> Dan's exited the chat. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's one thing I found as well that 
throughout lockdown, females especially can use their body weight for mm. like really good yeah. advantage because they find it hard to lift their body weight. They, they call that the whole female press up when you're on your knees. I mm. really don't like that name because yeah. it's the not press up seen, well you know what I mean? But yeah. yeah, when you're on your knees and you're doing a push up, like if you get really good at those, then you get your feet. Um, I know the females, especially a lot of my clients are coming back to the gym, like yourself, hitting PBs. And they were like, well, I haven't benched in so long. I was like, yeah, yeah but you got strong. Yeah. You, like, and that's, that's, that's all it is. And yeah. with the training side of things comes the nutrition. And I know this is another big this one. This is the biggest one. And, I yeah. And we, we've had chats off here about how many calories that you chuck down, you know, and I've yeah. seen that pancake recipe, right? That we're actually going to leave in the description for everyone. Um, <laughs> but how do you go about getting over the mental fears of consuming a lot of calories? Yeah, like personally, I went through sort of like I was a, I was a chubby kid because um, I had my tonsils taken out. So as soon as I had my tonsils taken out, because they were like so all the time, I just started eating everything in sight. Like I was loving life. I was pre I, I pretty much just just a little bit heavier than I was when I was about 12 now. So that goes to sh like, and I was obviously a lot shorter. I didn't have any muscles. So I was a chubby kid. Um, and then I just started training. When I was in year 10, I started training loads, decided to not eat as enough as I should have been eating. And I lost three stone in a few months. Um, so like that, that sort of sparked that I think a little bit of a negative relationship with food. It was like, oh, okay, I'm not eating much. I was literally training twice a day. I was running 5Ks three, four times a week. And then all of a sudden, I'd gone from this fat, chubby kid eating loads to like really scared. I must have been about 55 kilograms uh, in your 10. Um, I was running 5K in 19 minutes without training. It was, it was ridiculous. Like that. And I, but I had no, had like no idea about like how to fuel my, like, and I, and then I got picked up by uh, athletics um, by Swansea Harriers. And at the time I was like literally eating next to nothing. I'd, I'd say my calories was probably about 1,200 calories a day. Um, and, I was, and I was like training constantly. And then I think when I went into that environment, I was like, oh God, I'm tired all the time. Like I probably do need to start eating a bit more food. Then I came across veganism, which is not great, I know, but I was vegan for two years. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but I actually will say like in defense to being vegan, that that sort of period of two years sorted my, my problems with like eating too little or too much, um, big time because it's a lot of like veganism advocates, like you, because it's such low calorie food, you have to eat a lot of it. A lot of it. Yeah. To get enough in and like to get enough protein in and that kind of stuff. So that sort of sparked an interest in nutrition because i had to know what i was eating to make sure i wasn't like deficient and stuff so um i start i my instagram used to be called at the vegan gwen and i started like a, like loads of people <laughs> follow me and but i like i put out recipes and stuff like that like i was big into cooking i started a meal prep business at one at one point uh, but it didn't really get off the floor very well but i remember one was time it a I, vegan like, meal prep business yeah or? Yeah. No wonder why you didn't get off the floor. Then. All right. So, <laughs> so then I just ate all the meals myself anyway. But um, yeah, so got into that and then um, finally decided, I think it was like after a sevens tournament, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm starving. I was down the caravan. They were having a barbecue. I was like, oh, I'm just going to eat some chicken. Like, I don't even care anymore. Yeah, I'd gotten so over it. I was like, right, vegans out the window. And that is when I snapped my ACL. So I have a theory that like my body was adapting to changes in like, acidity levels and stuff and that might have increased my risk of injury but that's another story so stop being vegan then i sent my acl and that is when i really started to like focus on nutrition and training because all i could do was gym um and like off conditioning and stuff so that's when i put on a lot of muscle and i think i put on like 10 kilograms um obviously some of it was fat but it's going to be in it if you put on 10 kilograms so yeah. um started like concentrating okay Am I eat, like I was eating enough, probably a bit too much, but that's that's all right when you're trying to put on muscle in it. Um, so then came back to rugby, um, and then obviously being in an elite environment, then you start have people keeping an eye on what you're eating. You're like got eyes from everywhere. You get body fat tested, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but it wasn't actually. So I was just then, you know, people would look on me and be like, "Oh, Gwen knows what she's talking about. Gwen knows nutrition, blah blah blah." But I didn't actually 
know fully about like macros and if how to calculate how many you would need to lose weight blah, blah, blah. Um, other than just very very basic um, but then over lockdown I was like okay I'm gonna start tracking what I'm eating um, but what I found and what I struggled with is as soon as you start tracking you automatically eat less but th that's a good thing for people if they're trying to lose weight mm -hmm. but for me it was someone who had now a huge output like I say doing 12 sessions a week or whatever I was then eating less which wasn't a good thing because then I although I lost a bit of fat and stuff I think I, I lost a bit of, of muscle and then like I was fatigued all the time so then I spoke to our nutritionist with Wales and he was like oh you just need to you just need to eat more and I was like yeah all right and then when I started to do that I was like I actually found it really, really hard psychologically yeah into my fitness pal like a table, tablespoon of peanut butter, 150, I'm like 150 calories. Okay, that's quite a lot. That's a lot of fat, like constantly going through my head. So after like a month or two on my fitness pal, I'm like, like trying to get up to 3000 calories a day, but I was like falling short every day. Like I was hitting my protein, no problem. But because that's been drilled into me, you know, oh, you have to eat your protein, 50 grams protein each meal, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I was really, really struggling to get like carbs and fats up there as well. I was I was getting like two thousand five hundred calories when my calorie burn was probably three thousand and something a day. So I was just I just could not gain any weight. And the, a lot of my friends were like, just just eat more, just add more oats, add this. But psychologically, I couldn't put it in. I was like, I can't. Yeah. Like seeing that number of three thousand calories on days where I did get there, I should have felt accomplished. But I was feeling the opposite. I was like, oh, oh so many calories. Like, but I. Yeah. One part of my brain is like, oh, well, you're not even putting on any weight and you need to put on weight. But then the other half of my brain was like, eat less, move more, like be a girl. <laughs> that kind of stuff that gets drilled into you. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really, really difficult. And then, I, so I just basically binned off my fitness pal. I was like, right, you're, you're bad for my head. <laughs> so I was just like, well, I know I'm hitting my protein. So I'm just going to, and if I want to eat something extra, if I want to have a brownie, I'm going to have a brownie because I need more calories. So it's not a bad thing. If I want a brownie, then I'll eat a brownie. Um, and from doing that, I've put on like two or three K now, but maintained my fitness, maintained my speed. Like I'm still performing in the gym. So that has put me in a lot better of a psychological state to be like, okay, it's not, you know, being heavy doesn't necessarily mean no like, performance. Do you know what I mean? As long as you're yeah. training. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's like we, me and Joel spoke about it a couple of episodes ago about the, the whole tracking yeah. you know your food and stuff and and to be honest you know you see people say you've got to track your food you've got to track your food you've got to do this you've got to do that don't track your food it's bad for you it's, it's, it's like it's, it's bad for your mental health it becomes obsessive and to be honest like you said like it didn't work for you entirely mm. like it interrupted like your goal a little bit so ultimately i feel like uh i just want to make a point that tracking nutrition is entirely dependent on how you you deal with that sort of like psychological attribution to food yeah. and your relationship with food because i know like when you see that number when you you know you put like oh i don't know 150 grams of oats in the my fitness pan you see you're like jesus once you put yeah. your peanut butter you, you whatever else you put in there you're like jeez 600 calories <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, I know. yeah um i think i'm the opposite with that though because for like for my position, obviously loose head prop. I've got to be a bit heavier. I got a, a ninety-seven kilos as a as a loose head prop. I'm getting laughed at. You know what I mean? So my thing at the minute is I've got to put on like as much weight as possible. And there's a battle for, for me where subconsciously I'm like, I like the way I'm looking now. This is this is oh I'm heading in the right direction. Like we were training throughout lockdown, and it was like oh I'm heading. I'm doing the right things here. I'm seeing the improvements, but now I'm like, I've got to go back to rugby. I'm like, right, I've got to put this weight back on, sacrifice body composition a little bit. And I'm there and I'm thinking, right, how many calories do I need to eat a day? Me and Dan look at each other, we're like four and a half thousand calories yeah. a day. And I'm there and I'm like, right, <laughs> start tracking. By about meal four, you're like, oey, oh, this ain't going good. And I know for a fact, if I don't track, you I'll skip it. those meals and yeah. because I'm like subconsciously, oh, I'm full now. I don't need yeah. to eat. And that's the thing where I'm like, oh, right now I've actually got to stay accountable to my fitness pal. And I'm, I'm there and I'm like, right, I need to see that number on there. Cause otherwise I know for a fact, I'm not going to be going back to rugby in the best position possible. So yeah. it, it is that conflicting way and yeah. it didn't work for you. 
it works for me and that's that's what people got to understand with nutrition is about finding what works for them so whether that be intermittent fasting um paleo keto whatever if you can find something that's sustainable and works for you stick with it mm. don't try and preach that it's better than one thing it is better for you n equals one that one works for you and then you go find your thing i know dan's been captain captain my fitness bar recently as well haven't you yeah. yeah, but it's like if you've got a goal that requires you to do that, then that's fine. Like there will be certain times, like say now I was trying, like obviously same position as you, Joe. Like I got to put on a bit of weight now. Like I'm, I still probably need to put on three, four kilos, but I'm just gonna try and stick with it. Like try my best to eat enough, and if, if I get there, I get there. But then at the same time, I'm like, well, if I'm if I'm stronger than my opposition, even though they're heavier than me if I'm fitter than them and if I'm faster than them, does that, especially in women's rugby, does that like slight like difference in weight? It's not as important because if I've got a second row against me, that's 83 kilos and I'm 78 kilos, like that's not the end of the world. If I'm still fitter, faster and stronger than them. So that's what I'm trying to focus on a minute is like, is performance goals rather than, oh, am I heavy enough? Am I light enough? Like, it drives yeah. Whereas if I was going to go in and play sevens, I probably would track my calories just because I would need to be more like 74 kilos, for example, to be able to yeah, go. To get and that, that's the thing about, it might be optimal for you now, but mm. in three months' time, it might change. And yeah. for example, I know oh, it was the most accomplished thing. I turned up, um, we had like um, a medical with the club. We had to turn up yeah. and just... It was like going, and the coach was like, "You look like you put on some size." And I was like, "Oh, well, that's the first time you said that to me. I've always been there." Come on, Joe, you need to put on weight, son. You need to put yeah. on weight. Keep putting on weight. And he's like, oh, "You need to put on some size." I was like, "I, I look good, Greg. Th- th- thanks, mate. Thanks. I'll take that one. Lockdown's done me well, yeah." yeah. Does it still play on your mind that you're eating a higher amount of calories now? Yeah, it, I actually say like I, I don't go day where I'm not thinking about like. Well, I'm constantly planning, like, oh, what, what's for food here? Like, I literally plan out every single meal. Um, and it is always on my mind. Like, if I'm eating something, I'm like, oh, I don't think this is enough calories. Or then I'm having to go home and, like, force feed myself something because I'm like, I know that's not enough calories. Because obviously, once you've tracked for a while, you know the calories in something. Like, it's just, yeah. I've got one of those heads that literally just remembers everything. So if I could literally make a meal that I've made before and tracked and remember exactly what's in it and, so I do find that difficult, especially when it comes to enjoying food then. Like if I'm to go out somewhere, I know the, that how many calories is in that. But then the other part of my head is like, that's fine. It's fine to eat a bit more calories today because you're probably under on calories for the week. Um, so that's another thing that I try to say to a lot of people is like, it's all right if you're a bit under on on day to day. But then if, if you're going to make up for it in other areas, like... I, as a general rule of thumb, I try and make sure as long as I hit my protein every day, um, even if I'm a bit under on my calories, like, or roughly get, like, guesstimating like, my calories, on the weekend, I know for me, I will naturally eat more on the weekend because that could mean, like, going out for food or having someone over for food so I'd cook something a bit, like, higher in calories or whatever. So my, like, weekend calorie intake is more like 3,500 maybe. Whereas my weekly calorie intake is like 2,800, where it should be a bit more. But then I think at the minute it's sort of, sort of balancing out well. So that's where I am at the minute. Like I found that that works for me. But for other people, I know a few of the girls actually struggle to eat more on the weekend because they're busier and they have they are doing things with friends and blah, blah, blah. They're going for walks. So they don't actually eat enough on the weekend. So it, it works either way, I guess. Um, different people, like you were saying, like it might work for one, people, one person. It doesn't necessarily have to work for the next person. Yeah, and one final question from me, because um, I think we've covered a lot of topics. Who's a nutritionist for um, Wales Women's? Uh, Chris Edwards, his name is, at the minute, yeah. Blackie? Yeah. Yeah, because I've got nightmares about that bloke. So <laughs> when, when I was in and out the, the, the 20 setup, yeah. um, we'd have two groups of people. It'd be the ones that he'd watch get in the food, and then there'd be the ones that he didn't care about. And I remember going up one time, I, I picked up a thing of noodles, put it on. He's like, ah, do you really need all those carbs at all? I'm like, ah. <laughs> and then when it comes to body comp testing, he was like, ah, oh, oh, how tall is he? And I stood up the thing and weighed me up. He's like, ah, 
five foot ten, a little bit fat. I was like, <laughs> you're, not do, you're, not, you're not doing it for me at the minute, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. yeah. But he sent out, uh, so this just an example of it, like how different people react to things differently is that I was in like the lean muscle gain group. So he sent out my macro. So it's like two times, uh, 2.4 times body weight, uh, protein, like four times body weight, carbs, etc. Um, worked that out. My calories was 2,600. So I started eating like that and I was losing a kilo a week or like half a kilo a week, but that was meant to be me for gaining. Whereas there's, there's other girls that might be, in the like fat loss group and they'd be given their calories for l- loss and they'd be gaining because their met- metabolism and their, their output and everything is lower. So I struggled with that. I was like, well, I, I'm, this is how much I'm meant to be eating. Why am I not gaining any weight or why am I losing weight? But it is so individual that you have to find your no amount of calorie calculators is going to be better than trial and error. Like, yes, you can work out a calorie calculator. Okay. This is what I'll try. If you put on weight when you're trying to lose weight, change your calories if you get like you're losing weight and you're trying to gain weight just change it up like that's the biggest thing that i've learned is that you have to you have to actually trial it all out otherwise you can't just expect to hit your goal from a calorie calculator or from a macro calculator you're gonna you're gonna find what suits you best mm-hmm. that way, yeah you know? and and that's what i always say on so i got a calorie calculator on the website and yeah, i just say this is one i've ever used because it told me i could eat 3,100 calories <laughs> was like, yes <laughs> but on it i say this is an estimation mm. it's not going to be bang on it might be if you're that one percent that it works for happy days rave about their post on the story bring some people mm-hmm. tell them about it but <laughs> if it if it doesn't this is where you've got to be accountable and maybe get yourself a coach that knows what they're on about and you know oh i'm losing on say like you said 2600 where do i go from here well obviously i'm going to need to eat a little bit more and then that's where that trial and error thing comes in and Imagine how easy it'd be if we came in and we'd done everything perfect 100% of the time. Be easy yeah. life, wouldn't it? Dan, we wouldn't have a job, bro. <laughs> no. Yeah. I but I, I think that wraps up everything. Have you got any more questions, Dan? I was just going to point out the, the tracking thing back, back a couple of a points ago. About... Oh, Dan's obsessed with my fitness pal. Like he's still, he's, he's, <laughs> no, he's no, been no, sat no. there on his phone like that. No, but it, like, what I find is with females, especially like obviously non-athletic populations, like I feel like until they actually start tracking, they, they don't actually understand how much they're under eating. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I might set, you know, a client's macros and, and Carl's, I'd say, I don't know, say 1,800 calories or something like that. Um, for for a, a a cut, and they'd be like, "I can't eat all that." Yeah. So, I find that tracking initially is probably a be- a beneficial sort of like way of sort of working out sort of like your food. Yeah. Especially if like you've never done it before and you just kind of eat like on a whim, and eat, yeah. like especially people who work, mm. you know, they might eat what. Well, you know, I've had a client who was tracked and sent me their check-in on a Sunday and they've eaten 700 calories that day. I'm like, how do you only eat 700 calories in a day? That's breakfast, like, I know, it's mad. Yeah, exactly, like how? <laughs> I know, so, and I find that it is beneficial for, like, general population, like you're saying, to yeah. actually understand protein as well, because a lot of people do not understand, like, first you have to explain to them why protein is so important, but then... I'm looking at people's like how much protein they've eaten and it's like 80 grams for the entire day. And you're like, firstly, how can you only like, do you know, cause I constantly get yeah. protein, protein, protein. How can you only eat 80 grams of protein a day? But then how much that will actually like affect their satiety levels and like their performance and everything and recovery and, and, and stuff. Yeah. When they're actually educated on this is how much protein you, you need to use. So like if ever, some days I do track, like not every day, but some days I do track just to make sure I fit my protein. That's what I find my uh, my fitness part really, really useful for. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's just the point I wanted to make, really. Yeah, with that and like the under eating uh, is bonkers because I'll be honest, I've set clients into like aggressive, do you know, like fat loss because they've got like four, four to six weeks before they want to go on holiday. That's their bias. They're like, I want to get in shape for this holiday. I'm like, all right, you're going to need to eat quite a low amount of calories. 
Yeah. Like that's that's a be all and end all of it. It's not sustainable, but when we come back, we can talk about that sustainability aspect after. So and then set probably regular in it. Yeah, you set you set um, days. a calorie target, and it's like, oh right, we're looking at like twelve hundred calories. You go, that's a lot, mind it? Yeah, and I'm like twelve hundred calories. That's a lot. See nothing. I know. Like, <laughs> it baffles me. But a lot, like even girls that play at my level of rugby are eating. 1,500 calories. I'm like, how can you even function? Like, I can't, I can't even imagine being able to train on that many calories, like before training, and then imagine not eating anything else after training. Oh, it baffles me. But it's it's completely. I think it's all about education because there is a yeah. lack of education with women to do nutrition because of how much it's drilled into them. Just eat less. Like yeah. they don't actually understand why they need to eat. A certain amount of carbs why they need to eat fats like how important it is for your health like all they get told yeah. is less move more which isn't uh, necessarily always the answer like do you remember those um sort of like all round like global nutritional recommendations for calories for men and women it was like 1800 calories for women and 2000 calories for men i feel like women they get attached to that you know sub 2000 calorie sort of like landmark and they as soon as that starts creeping above 2000 it's like panic more jesus christ yeah. i'm eating way too much i'm gonna get fat yeah and I, I feel like it's same it's same as for men because you know I you know I've got some lads who you know I've given them say you know three thousand calories and they like fuck me bro it's a bit much yeah I'm like mm. nah it really ain't yeah yeah and I've I've got one client at the minute on four thousand five hundred and every day he texts and goes I'm not a fan of yours I'm not a fan <laughs> of yours and the and the thing is he eats super clean. Yeah, so, it's going to be difficult then, isn't it? Yeah. And he eats, so I look at his breakfast and it's like 250 gram of oats with three scoops of peanut butter. And I'm like, bro, just enjoy yourself. And then he messages me on there, like, he'll, he'll message yeah. me on the weekends. He'll go, I was some ice cream today, pal. I'm like, uh, you know what? You, uh, you enjoy yourself some ice cream. And he's like, <laughs> Still got 600 calories left. What do I have? I'm like, ah, more, more ice cream. Fancy. <laughs> more ice cream. <laughs> ah, some ice cream. <laughs> and I'm like, I've had it. But no, I've really enjoyed chatting to you today. Um, yeah. And obviously you've got your own um, performance slash nutrition page. Um, oh. If you want to give yourself a little shameless plug to anything that you want, even your SoundCloud, if you want to drop that in you. Yeah, Definitely. Um, yeah, it's at CT performance underscore nutrition. Um, so like I chuck recipes up on there, some of my training and stuff, but yeah, I'm writing a nutrition ebook basically, um, where it's just about like the basics of nutrition. So like, um, a little bit about carbs, fats, and protein, why you need them, why they're so important, that kind of thing. Um, then sorry to steal your calorie calculator line life, but I got one as well. Um, so it's like a link to that calorie calculator, but it's, I think it's a recording now. No, I think it's the same uh, equation that it's worked out well. So it's basically the same. Um, and then um, just a lot of like recipes. So um, I've done like breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. Um, and then like some breakfast ones are like my own recipes. But then there's other ones I also use that I just chuck the link into. So say if it's on BBC or whatever, it's just got the link on it. Um, so I'm hoping to get that done by October. So um, yeah, it's, it's £10 for the whole ebook. And it's going to have like 40, 50 recipes in it. So yeah well wow. days you can go mm-hmm. pick i'll buy it i'll buy it <laughs> if it's got the pancake recipes in it i'm buying it yeah, yeah two pancake recipes in there actually have you tried making them yet I, i'm literally probably gonna go do it after this this has sparked <laughs> a little bit of enthusiasm in me yeah. and i'm gonna go make it and i will put it on the gram yeah they are good yeah um yeah and then my like other instagram is just at gwen crab um, so I like chuck some stuff on there, but like body confidence and that every now and then, it's worth giving it a follow. So, yeah. yeah. So we will leave those in the description, and yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on. And hopefully, uh, the rugby season kicks off to some normality. And good luck in the upcoming games in October, and then hopefully onto the the Six Nations World Cup next year. Then. Thanks for coming on. <laughs>